Welcome to the Seven Things EMS Podcast, a continuing education offering of Limmer Education. Seven Things EMS Podcast is designed to give you what you need to succeed in EMS. It's conversational, informational, and without the fluff. And the Seven Things EMS podcast is talking about resuscitation today. I'm Dan Limmer. I'm here with, very fortunate to be here with Bobby Wales, who's the Director of Education uh, for the American Heart Association. He's been with the Heart Association for 12 years. We've all been jealous of Bobby's international travels, uh, as he did a lot of international work for the Heart Association. Now, as the Director of Education, we're going to talk about resuscitation, and uh, even bigger picture, what the uh, standards mean and how they apply to EMS. Early defibrillation is critical to survival from VFib and pulseless VTAC cardiac arrest. Absolutely. I think that's, other than CPR, uh, that's the other most important factor in survival. Um, And we do see strong evidence that says that defibrillation is most successful when it's administered early after the onset of of pulseless VTAC or VFib. Um, There's some evidence that biphasic defibrillators have greater success in terminating arrhythmias. Um, And then there's various devices that have different forms of shock waves that they deliver, but there's not really any any evidence that one is is better than the other as far as the, the form of the shock wave. Um, for people like you and I who've been around for a little while, um, you know, now we're recommending only to provide a single shock and then immediately resume CPR. Uh, we're not doing the stack shocks that we did back in the day, the shock, 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 epi shock. Uh, I, could, I could probably recite that in my sleep still after my yes. uh, oh, yeah. initial paramedic training. Um, and we used to give a lot of recommendations around energy doses, but each manufacturer has kind of gone in different directions in the way that they deliver the energy. A lot of them will measure the impedance of the chest. So that basically just means how much tissue there is blocking that electrical conduction. So a very thin person, the monitor may measure that and say they don't need as high of a dose or a very large person uh, may need a higher dose. So we'll just say now that you should follow the manufacturer's recommendations for whatever device that you use. Uh, but ideally, what you want to do is provide compressions while the defibrillator is being applied, while it's being charged. And then, obviously, we clear for the shock. Immediately after the shock is delivered, resume CPR. We don't need to stop and look for a rhythm. Another thing that we did back in the day, um, we just go right back to CPR and um, perform high-quality CPR for two minutes until it's time to reanalyze and defibrillate again, potentially. And then for a BLS provider, it would be the same thing for a pulse check. You're getting right back on the chest doing compressions. There's no pulse checks. That really we're looking for, um, we're looking to do great CPR, minimal uh, stops. But if the patient starts to show signs of life, that's when we would go for the pulse check. Absolutely. Yes. The only uh, change I think I would make with with, uh, basic EMS providers is if you're using an AED, most AEDs now have been updated to where they will allow you to resume compressions after it has analyzed and while it is charging so that you are not off the chest for too long. If you've, if you've played with AEDs, you know that once it starts to analyze, it's going to take eight seconds or so to analyze, and then it's going to take another five to six seconds to charge, and then you can shock. So by the time you get off the chest, analyze, shock, uh, and get back on the chest, you could have a 20-second delay easily. Um, so our recommendation is that you should resume compressions after it has analyzed while it is charging and then stop again to deliver the shock and then resume again immediately so that you're not off the chest too long. Uh, but some some AEDs will continue to analyze throughout the shock or the charging period uh, leading up to the shock and doing compressions can interfere with its its ability. So I would just say if you are a basic EMS provider and you use AEDs, you should know what the AED that you're using, um, how it's set up and programmed, and whether or not you can do that before you get into a cardiac arrest situation. 
I know I'm talking to an expert when they say it takes about eight seconds to analyze, not 10, not five, <laughs> eight. I think that's that's very impressive. I was going to share that. Let me, just, let me just look at number one and two together here and, and fire a question out because I know I hear a lot of things from people about, well, do I do some CPR before I defibrillate in an unwitnessed arrest? You know, what happens, you know, in that kind of situation? And I know that you said there are some, um, you know, there's a certain amount of clinical practice with unknown downtime. You can certainly start compressions while you're applying the AED if you have multiple people, but EMS people like what ifs. Does the Heart Association have a stand on the defibrillation compression and how that goes with the new guidelines? Yeah, we really like to make our recommendations based on research that we have on hand and not really any research that has looked at, is there a difference in those initial seconds of whether to do compressions first or defibrillation first? What the research does say is that the earlier you can defibrillate, the better. However, in the EMS setting, it's very rare that your patient goes into cardiac arrest when you already have the pads on them and you're ready to go. So in most cases, you're going to have a period of CPR while you're applying the monitor anyway. So it kind of makes the question a little bit less relevant. But in the circumstance, which I have had happen in the clinical setting, in my experience, where you have a patient who you can tell is um, in a peri-arrest condition, and you have proactively attached the pads and you see them go into VF. Uh, in one patient I had, I was running a 12 lead when they changed to VF. Um, there's no reason to delay shocking to start performing CPR. In a situation like that, you know their heart has been perfusing, even if not perfusing well. Um, so the idea that we would need to prep the heart with a few minutes of CPR before defibrillating is not correct. And I would say in all circumstances, it would be reasonable to start with a shock as soon as you can effectively deliver it. But if you can't deliver it instantly, then I would immediately begin compressions while we set up to deliver that shock. 